the infamous or famous Dr. Tymar. And um, I'll just turn it over to him. So. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, I think I have plenty of time, so I will take it rather slow. If, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's not a threat, right? <laughs> I try, just try to keep entertaining you, so that's, that should be okay. And uh, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, of course, so we can have an interesting discussion. So um, this talk is about the Space Drive project, and um, so um, it's a kind of an intermediate uh, 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 test, uh, uh, where, where, kind of where we are today. Yeah? So progress in testing and modeling on Mach effect thrusters and EM drives. And this is not only me, but, but of course also all my students. And uh, three of the PhD students who are working on this are here with me. And um, tonight at the hotel, they will say whatever I said, even in more detail. So if you don't have enough from this talk, please feel free to come in the evening and we have an even better discussion then. Um, plus, I would very much like to uh, thank my sponsor, DLR, for uh, funding us on this endeavor uh, to find out uh, um, if we can make this work. Okay, so um, we all are interested in interstellar flight, right? That's why we are here. And uh, if we look, uh, uh, you know, how we can do that, and Hollywood tells us there are two ways to do that. First, uh, option A, interstellar, is uh, that actually we need something like a black hole, right? So unfortunately, nothing in the neighborhood as far as we know. And uh, option B is Star Trek. We need something like a warp drive. It's a nice name, but... <laughs> you know, how to make it work in real, that's, that's the question. Nevertheless, uh, we are living in an exciting times right now because uh, things are moving. And uh, for example, really interesting announcement, right? Project Starshot, kind of uh, a year ago, um, they are trying to put some serious money into looking into interstellar flight. And uh, well, their option is to use a very high power laser and have nano-sized spacecraft over there flying to uh, the very next star. Um, that sounds very exciting, lots of challenges, but even if they make it, you know, I was dreaming about a spacecraft, right? So something manned and to go there and come back and whatever, manned 40 years, also with that approach, not such a good idea. So are we left with something? Actually, that is two things uh, popping up uh, even today on websites and whatever. Go back to that slide and comment on, on uh, Dyson's ideas. <laughs> Freeman Dyson, um, there is no recent discussion on that famous project, right? You mean the super mega project Orion? Uh, actually, I don't know what you mean, but I mean, I just saw his name on this. Uh... Ah, okay, from here, yeah, yeah. Sure, he's part of the team. He's part of the team from Breakthrough Starshot. So they, they got a number of famous scientists, uh, Stephen Hawking and so on, uh, to support, you know, as a kind of chairman to, to support this this endeavor. So they, they have a website with challenges and they're trying to make call for proposals and you can apply to one of these challenges. That's the way I understand it. And uh, you can try to develop technology, what they need for that kind of project. Uh, what is the idea? The idea? Okay. The idea is to have, um, if, uh, if I get it right, it's a 100 gigawatt laser that you have to put together. And this 100 gigawatt laser is going to push um, um, a sail from uh, a spacecraft with the size of this little chip here. And uh, within a few seconds, the idea is then that this would uh, uh, push this nano spacecraft up to 20% the speed of light. Mm. Now 100 gigawatt laser. <laughs> right? <laughs> For a few seconds. How do you store the energy? <laughs> Challenge number one. <laughs> yes. And so on. Right, yeah, so for sure it's gone, but probably it's gone forever and not to the next end. And so on. Yeah. So so there are lots of challenges, but that's that's a plan. Yeah. That's a concrete plan. And they put some decent money into that. So that's that's a plan. But but it's maybe Probably it's nearly as impossible as Mach effect thrusters, big scale, or AM drives, or whatever. So I just want to mention it as one of the plans that are under discussion right now. Who, who is funding this? Um, this billionaire. Yuri Milner. Yuri Milner and Mark oh, Milner. Oh, oh, okay. Private money. Russian millionaire. Oh, uh huh. Yep. So private industry is moving ahead. It's good. <laughs> so. Okay, so but that's that's something just for illustration that's going on right now. But um, yeah, we're interested more in the kind of interstellar spacecraft type of thing, uh, um, like like Star Trek and so on. So 
the two things under serious investigation, I would say more serious investigation right now, is the M drive. And uh, for instance, uh, everyone is talking about this. And at least, I mean, I heard it's, it's one of the most highly cited papers uh, um, from the Journal of Propulsion and Power, where Sunny White published uh, his, uh, his article. So at least uh, he really got lots of attention. And uh, also I think the Mach Effect Trust has been around for quite some time. And uh, now we are going in with, with great speed ahead, right? So uh, we have now four laboratories that are seeing similar effects. You got this NASA NIAC grant. So the SS Park workshop, I think things are really moving now into the right direction. And um, so I thought, well, those are really two great, uh, great things to do. So um, um, I started the space drive project and in the space drive project, well, the goal is of course propellant as propulsion, more efficient than radiation. Well, that's the thing, we have to beat that. Huh? So that's propellant as propulsion, but we have to be much better than this in order to do something really meaningful. So in that project, I would like to really thoroughly investigate Mach effect thrusters, EM drives, by building test models, lots of test models, investigate scaling issues, uh, verify this on, on thrust balances, not necessarily one, um, make drastic improvements in measurement techniques, those kind of new devices, they require very careful attention. And uh, so actually dedicated thrust balance developments, it's a very important aspect of this project. So we are also going to develop an alternative thrust balance in addition to this traditional torsion balances. So I want to go totally friction free, <laughs> to be free of any friction. I think that's very important for that. And we're doing a couple of very complementary experiments uh, um, to check uh, influence of temperature, uh, um, to directly measure this uh, Machian mass fluctuations and so on and so forth that can all feed them back into these two uh, thruster projects. So. Yeah. So when you say uh, that you want to go totally friction free, what friction is the one that you see in the present experiment? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I cannot uh, quote you a number on that. Um, of course, a torsion balance, um, they are saying a torsion balance is basically friction free as well. Um, because, well, I mean, it's just bending, right? There is no, no friction, it's a friction free thing. What I mean maybe more, even more than this friction free is that I will go friction free and move yeah, by 360 degrees to be sure that I can indeed, you know, make a full turn. I think that would be extremely important. So we're trying to work this out. This is a very challenging thing. And it took just half a year with a student to, to come up, you know, with lots of, to, to come up with a kind of final design that could make it theoretically <laughs> for that low thrust values. That's the challenge, yeah? Friction-free, 360 degrees, and with, you know, 0.1 or 0 0.001 uh, micronewton uh, accuracy. So that's, that's, that's my goal. So that's very challenging, but probably we will have a prototype next year. So I think, yeah, interesting, a very interesting test program. And uh, I also got a very good team together for that effort. So three, three of the students are here that will show what they are doing on the thrust balance and on the uh, Mach effect thruster. Um, then we are trying to model the Mach effect thrusters not only analytically but also numerically uh, with state-of-the-art tools, uh, trying to build the M drive. We get electronic support and have a number of master students. Also everyone is picking you know, a topic and uh, I have a number of new topics for the next year students here, of course, as well. So it's a quite interesting team and uh, that's where we are. <laughs> so let me show you where we are. I'm really trying to go step by step, no quick measurements and, and quickly doing something together and doing something up. I have time, yeah, I have time. I want to do this properly. Everything step by step to understand what we're doing, to be sure, and then go to the next step. So very important is, of course, the thrust balance. We need to rely on good measurements, right? So thrust balance, very important. And I mean, of course, I'm quite experienced also in thrust balances, I think four, fifth generation or whatever that we are doing here uh, in Dresden. So we took another turn of big improvement on the thrust balance that you knew from last year. So the biggest thing is that basically we, um, <laughs> we put a huge concrete block below our 
vacuum chamber and um, isolated it from the foundation uh, of, of the building and so on and so forth. So that was um, that shut us down for quite some time because we had to move the vacuum chamber, you know, uh, um, tear apart the floor and everything. But we wanted to get really the best facility that we can. Um, from damping, uh, so we made everything adjustable that we can change damping factors. Um, we have two different calibration methods now that we can even calibrate the calibration technique, you know, online, everything here that's very important. Um, everything was going into automatically control, things that we did previously manually, so for example by leveling uh, the, um, uh, the thrust balance, so everything here is now done in a very automatic way. Um, the noise is still where it is, but uh, uh, um, we still didn't implement uh, everything that we were thinking of, so we will now really approach really going to the nanonewton range. Um, we even changed, uh, that was also very interesting, we even changed the electric feed throughs, right? Everyone is using liquid metal contacts. We have now liquid metal coaxial uh, contacts, so we can even shield every, uh, uh, um, every contact. It's, it's really in, uh, interesting. The whole thing should be shielded as well, so uh, we have um, mu metal, so permalloy, uh, shielding uh, from the balance arm, from every box and so on and so forth. Um, so that was, that kept us busy for some time at least. And so the new feature list of the thrust balance that we're talking about is that we can have up to 25 kilograms of thrust and electronics. Um, yeah, we are approaching the nanonewton uh, thrust noise. The thrust resolution is much, much better. So we are way <coughs> below the nanonewton range. We have variable eddy current damping uh, with stepper motor control. Uh, we have stepper motor leveling. Um, we can uh, even change it with a stepper motor the orientation of the thruster. Yeah, so uh, we can make, you know, facing that direction, then we can go 90 degrees, we can go 180 degrees without uh, opening up the chamber where you can introduce drifts and whatever so forth. So we stay in a certain configuration, we can change orientation. That's extremely important, for example, to get out uh, any kind of uh, thermal uh, effects. Yeah? When things heat up, they change uh, the center of gravity that looks like a thrust. So by changing that, you know, after one measurement, you change, you check if, um, you, know, you can very well check if you have a really very good zero point measurement, you can see drifts and so on. So that's what we did here. Um, we have wireless control of everything, uh, working on some laser links even uh, here. Uh, yeah, this coax liquid metal contacts, that's very new. I haven't seen this anywhere. And the whole thing um, can be operated with a script language. So you can, you can, prog you can program the whole thing, uh, um, perform calibration, do a measurement, recalibrate again, save everything, do the same thing again a hundred times, check for consistency, the data comes all together, you can average out the noise, everything in an automatic way. Yep. Two questions, are, are you using an external coil to cancel out the Earth's magnetic field or depending on the mu metal? Um, no, we have, well, actually I'm getting Helmholtz coils now, so we may be able to do this in the future. Uh, so far, uh, we are not doing that. But actually, magnetic interaction is coming up. It's a very good thing to do. It's a very good thing to do, yep. The other question is, on the coax liquid feed throughs, uh, how many lines, uh, independent uh, connections, do you have going through? OK, right now, I think we have four coax lines, right? Yeah, but four pairs. Yeah, yes. four pairs. Yeah, four coax mm -hmm. ones. And we can add some if we need to. The thing is, uh, we don't need that many um, because uh, we have uh, on the balance on board power. So, uh, um, for example, we have data acquisition, everything on the balance. Everyone else is bringing with contacts everything out, right? So we can measure everything on the balance. So we have, um, I think with this data acquisition card, I have 83 channels. Mm -hmm. I can put thermocouples, you know, as many as you like. I can measure voltage, currents and whatever. Uh, we if have even the possibility to have an uh, onboard oscilloscope uh, on the balance. We have an infrared camera. Feed How much power we can put there? Yeah. yeah. So right now we have maximum 100. Yeah, we have 28 volts and max 10 amps. Mm -hmm. So wow. 300 in, volts, in, so a little bit low. Internally, inside that's right. Like, uh, no, no, the power supply is actually outside of the vacuum chamber, oh. and we use one pair to put the voltage and the current on the balance. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about uh, monitoring the temperature? How many? But I'm saying we have 83 channels. I can put as many thermocouples as you like. 
And even we have even my infrared camera on the balance so we can map the thermal environment of the experiment of the balance. But the problem with the, for example, the MET or Mega Drive is that the heat is internally generated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you just do a Fourier analysis, you will see that the temperature is much higher in the center. Sure. And you, uh, if you put the thermocouple in the center, then you are interfering with the effect. You have any approach to measure the, temp the temperature inside the mega drive? Here I'm talking about the thrust balance. <laughs> the mega drive from Archivec Thrust is coming up, but uh, we haven't uh, thought about implementing a thermocouple inside. But but. At least we have a thermal infrared camera now, so we can measure the whole thermal environment. Measure the infrared coming off of it. Yeah, but there's quite time delay and they're only doing the experimental I think our approach to that would be that, um, I mean, you can model the thermal environment right. quite well, right? Yeah. So we can have that we can do outside, yeah? So, yeah. We do a good thermal model. If you can destroy the experiment, then you can also drill and then uh, holes, very small holes, and that works very well to, with uh, embedding, then placement, measuring a thermal couple that way. Right. But then, exactly. Not, not so, with the mega drive. So if we have a very good finite element model, we can do mechanical and thermal analysis. So yeah, that's how I would do it because we can validate the model by outside measurements and so on, right? So that's how I would do it. Okay? Good, so um, that's how the new setup looks like, this huge uh, concrete block um, with, um, uh, with the whole facility up there. So it's um, uh, 1.6 meter long, kind of a meter diameter um, and, um, uh, well, no, that's the concrete block below, but it has the same dimensions here. So 0.9 meters diameter, 1.5 meter long, turbo pump um, that can go to, um, well, we can go to the 10 minus 7 millibar or uh, tor a vacuum, um, but um, that's probably not even necessary here. But it's a really nice vacuum chamber with lots of space to do all the experiments here. Yeah. How fast can you pump it down? <laughs> um, that depends. So for example, let's say in half an hour, whatever, you're in a medium vacuum range. And if you go, um, we always, usually if we use high vacuum, then we do this overnight. Uh, just to be sure. I mean, you are very quickly in the 10 minus 5 range, but if you want to go 10 minus 6 and better, you have to do this overnight. But it's not really necessary, right? So, buoyancy effects, if you're even in medium range vacuum, that's okay. And, um, and you, have, you have humidity control in the room. Is it, is it more to drive before you do the circuit experiment? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had this in Austria, but this was necessary for if you produce flight hardware for a European Space Agency. Um, no, we're a university lab, so I don't have humidity control for my big batch. Okay, chamber. so, because if I understand it right, the, 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 the Mach unit we have currently, the mega unit, is hygroscopic, so it sucks water out of the air and that brings the, the experiment. Right. But, well, coming up, we have a special storage for this type of thruster um, um, coming up. But you have to take it out. You have to mount it anyway. So we don't, you know, we are not astronauts <laughs> working in a huge vacuum environment, whatever. Okay, so so we take it out anyway. And then, uh, yeah. Are you preparing a clean room environment? Well, we do have a clean room, but that's at, at the moment, that's unnecessary. Why, why is it necessary? I'm just curious. Yeah. So we, we have these possibilities, but... Um, no need so far. But, but you will see we greatly improved on the storage capability because they're not stored in vacuum. So I think that's, that's quite good. Okay, now the whole thing again can be run by um, LabVIEW software. And as I learned uh, yesterday, uh, um, yeah, well, whatever. So it is LabVIEW, I, I like LabVIEW, so <laughs> very important. And uh, so we can uh, quickly uh, change configurations. Um, we have uh, um, every kind of device, you know, stored in this program. So I can just, I can use uh, this uh, amplifier and I can combine it with that uh, uh, oscilloscope, for instance, or I can use uh, the data acquisition on a balance, whatever. I can quickly change the configuration of what I'm doing. Um, it also does uh, closed loop control. So for example, if I want to run the thrust balance um, in um, closed loop configuration, such that it not moves, that it doesn't move, but you have an actuator that is 
you, we, we are looking you know, for the displacement and then with an actuator that can cancel this movement such that the balance always stays still. But this method, you cancel out any kind of spring constant related uh, things. So you can do this here too. So it can work in closed loop as well. And the good thing here is that the software can even do all the frequency analysis here. So you don't need any kind of separate uh, uh, soft or hardware or whatever. You just uh, put this on and you can run the thruster in thruster mode or you can do a frequency sweep and uh, you can identify um, the peaks. It automatically calculates Q factors. Um, you can then select a certain peak. You can um, uh, have different strategies for the tracker and uh, you, can, uh, you can say, for example, uh, uh, minimize uh, reflected power uh, for the M drive, for instance, and then it just stays there, whatever happening, even if it's uh, heating up, changing frequency, it always keeps track on that. So you can redo the spectrum analysis after each test, you can save that, so everything is built in there. Um, yeah, and it's working again, uh, even uh, with a script language. Um, how is this being done? So you can get calibration, then you do profiles, and um, we do always the profiles like this, that were thruster off, thruster on, and a thruster off, and we repeat this many times, hundreds of times, 200 times, or whatever. Then we can track exactly what is our uh, zero position, right? So such that we can automatically take out drifts, so we, we monitor the zero position, we can extrapolate that. Uh, we can take out normal drifts, we can even take out thermal drifts. I can detect the thermal signature, so I know when the, after, for example, one uh, thruster profile, if now my zero point is up there, so I, I know that and I can extrapolate that and I can automatically take out uh, thermal drifts. The beauty of this is because it's all done in an automatic way, you know, I treat all the data the same and I can make this for hundreds of profiles and whatever, so it's all been done the same way. So that's a very important thing. I can average the profiles, so I can get significance, yeah, I can increase the significance here, I can reduce the noise, this kind of stuff. How does the typical calibration look like? Um, again, this is also done automatic way, I can do many, many measurements here. For example, this is, um, um, you know, a quarter of micronewton steps, uh, you can see the displacement uh, over the calibration force and you can see our, um, our constant calibration constant such that we have something like 20 micronewtons uh, per micrometer of displacement from uh, the balance. And um, if you have now different setups, for example, the M drive is much more heavy in our setup because of all the amplifiers and so on than if you would test the Mach effect faster. So we get a different calibration constants and of course we have to track that, save that and whatever. So we cannot use the same calibration constant for different setups. So that's why we always calibrate before. Important thing is whatever setup we have, it's really highly linear and highly repeatable. That's the important thing here. Now, how does this look like in reality now? So for example, this is the typical, let's say, noise value. So here you can see we are in the noise of something like uh, 20 micronewton uh, peak to peak. And uh, we are still, we, can st we think we can still get much better because we have a noise source on the balance that we have to shut down in order to improve this. So that's what we are going to do next. And here you can see a typical measurement, the first measurement here with our new EM drive, for instance, um, that is already thermally drift compensated. So all these typical signatures, they are gone. So you can get the pure uh, a thruster measurement here. So medium vacuum in that case, uh, 1.8 um, uh, giga, uh, gigahertz frequency with tracker. So we leave, it, we leave it quiet for some time. We turn it on, you see here the amplifier. So that's the amplifier current going to something like 2.5 amps. So it's active, you can see under brackets a thrust. Very important please, yeah? Work in progress, no final conclusion. Don't quote me on, I verify whatever, okay? <laughs> this is work in progress. Okay, for the camera, very important, yeah, so. Um, no, 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 because always we validate or whatever. So this work in progress, I'm not sure yet, so. What is the main source of noise? Where you got that noise there, uh, okay. plus minus point 0.8, what is the main source okay. of noise? Um, typically, so when you really approach, the best noise that we have is thermal noise. That's, that's ideally the, the, the most dominant uh, factor that we have here. We think that we have a different, we have another error source because of all the stepper motors that I just told you before. Um, the stepper motors, um, although we are in, uh, in um, you, 
we have to completely shut them off from the power supply with a relay. Right now, we just reduce uh, the working um, uh, the, uh, the working current yeah, to a very small uh, uh, range, but the stepper motor always tries to maintain its position. So it's slightly you know, oscillating a little bit. So we think that this is an oscillation motion that we have to get rid of to improve this. It's very technical detail. Um, but ideally, and also from what we have seen with reference measurements, actually we are approaching thermal noise. So you can only get better by cooling down uh, the um, frost balance. How, how big is the uh, uh, thermal noise, both Boltzmann noise, mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, top noise here? Okay, well the noise here is about uh, uh, 10 to 20 nanonewtons. Yeah. So that's a fluctuation from the, of course, I'm measuring a displacement, right? right. So uh, I'm in the nanometer range. Uh, yeah, I'm in a nanometer range, so it's oscillating order of magnitude nanometer range. And if you look, that's the thermal noise. So you have to... You're saying the thermal noise is on the same order as 20 newton <laughs> not, not here. I think we can still, we need to go down a little bit more, but we will approach, we did with reference measurements. So reference measurements meaning that I look with my interferometer, I don't look at the balance, but I look at something fixed. And then yeah, what I'm measuring is the thermal noise. So I know then, okay, it's oscillating, let's say in a nanometer range, and that's what we still have to do for the balance to be, you know, it's also a matter of, of the damping efficiency. So we increase the damping efficiency, but that's coming up. But I think we will approach the thermal noise. That's the most dominant factor that I cannot control here anymore. Otherwise I would have to cool the balance. How much power does that 2.5 amps represent? Um, how much power? I think this was something like two or five watts, something like this, between two and five watts. Uh, and what was the uh, uh, source, the RF source? Here? Um, we are coming up. This is just a sample measurement. I'm coming to the thrust actually next slide. Okay? Just to illustrate to you how this works. Important thing is here also we have very long downtime, then on, off, such that all the electronics and whatever really cool down, everything gets stable, yeah? So, and then, then we repeat. Yeah. Okay, so work in progress, no final conclusion here. But we are getting there, thrust balance did a major improvement here. Now, how do we approach the EM drive? So as you know, I mean, I've built this, uh, um, yeah, with a, yeah, well, it was not a very crude setup, but I mean, I took from a microwave oven, I took, <laughs> you know, the electronics and, and we built a kind of a truncated cone and married it together. So the Q factor was not very high. We had an order of between 20 and 50. The Q factor wasn't very good because we couldn't tune in the frequency. So uh, that wasn't possible in the setup. So now we wanted to try it for real. Um, what are we trying to do here? So in our first task, we said, let's focus on three different geometries. For as a reference one, let's focus on the one that NASA Eagleworks did, Sunny White, they published whatever they did in a good journal paper. So let's try to do the same thing, the same geometry to have some reference to what we should expect. So I feel the truncated cone, um, uh, dimension similar. Uh, we can even change, we can change from flat end to a curved end. We can put the dielectric in or with no dielectric and whatever. So we're flexible here. Um, we also tried to do something, uh, uh, this was Marcel's idea, to do something uh, uh, um, um, more easy to manufacture because to do this right is some effort. Yeah? So you will see how we did this. So um, we tried to do this really good. So uh, uh, this is some effort. This one, um, uh, it's relatively easy to do. So it's a truncated pyramid. So uh, Marcel did uh, mode simulations and uh, you can see very similar uh, modes than uh, with the NASA design, but this is much more simple. You just order, in our case, we had uh, PCB boards. Uh, that we just uh, cut you know, with water cutting and you simply glue it together and you're done. So you have, um, you have um, a less efficient EM drive. Why, why do you say it's less efficient? Because Scheuer doesn't say it's less efficient. Yeah, less efficient because the Q factor is, is less. So we have measurements and simulations. So it's less efficient. You can do it, but coming up, coming up. It's all coming up. So. The last one that we are looking at uh, is the so-called baby M drive. This is a cooperation that we do with Paul Kotzila, very gifted electrical engineer. And uh, he built uh, a miniature EM drive uh, for 24 gigahertz. 
that's extremely challenging. Yeah? So from the electronics point of view, so it's a one watt, 24 gigahertz uh, um, um, signal generator and amplifier there. And uh, that frequency range, <laughs> everything counts, right? So uh, efficiency is, um, is, uh, is a big problem here. But we are trying this uh, out as well. Um, we're doing com solid modeling for doing mode analysis, this kind of stuff. We're doing spectrum analysis with a, with a network analyzer. We're doing thrust measurements and we're trying to uh, really quantify the um, uh, interaction of this type of thruster with its environment. So thermally speaking, magnetically speaking, this kind of stuff, doing a proper air analysis to uh, what we are doing. Martin, yep. on Cosilas, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the way you pronounce it. Um, What's the size? What's the diameter on that, that thing? I can't. Maybe six well, inches. it's maybe three centimeters or so. Three, four centimeters, five, three, four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Four, like four centimeters high. Sounds what's like the this. diameter? Yeah, that's the, it, that's everything here. I mean, it's let's say four centimeters high, four centimeters diameter, something like this. You were designed to have a similar mold shape, uh, TE 012 or 013 at 24 gigahertz, so you can, from knowing that it's the same uh, mode as the as, uh, right one, you can size it. What's the frequency of the, of the big one? The big one is 2.4 gigahertz, the initial one by showing. So it's a factor of 10. A factor of 10, right. So the, so the, for the wavelength ought to be a factor of 10 small, right? So it's shrinking down, yeah. It, his intention was to fly this uh, on, a, on a pocket set, so even smaller than a cube set. Really very small thing. Um, right, so that's that's intention, that's why it's small. I mean, it's great, if, if it works, then try it out in space, you know, that, that would be really good, but we're not there yet. Okay, so, um, now, truncated conical cavity design. Um, yeah, we are using coaxial components, the off-the-shelf, cheap, lightweight, and so on. I really don't like this uh, thing okay. here. While that's well, out, we're gonna put it in. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Okay, um, our intention is to go first with low power to have uh, uh, not so much heating um, and, uh, um, you know, also uh, <laughs> a little bit scared that when we play around with these microwaves, if they're not 100% properly shielded, that someone will knock on our door and will say, hey, I think you <laughs> uh, you're working in, um, in, in the frequency band from, you know, also interesting for this type of phone. So um, starting with low power first, that's very important. Just put it in your pocket. Yep, somewhere, okay, thanks. And um, okay, the cone dimensions are very similar to the ones from, from Sunny White. And again, we can do with and without um, the, the, the uh, um, poly, uh, polyethylene insert, flat spherical cap bands. We can run different frequencies, different power levels. And um, that's how it looks with simulation you can simulate different modes. And uh, um, so we're trying to optimize it for, of course, minimize power reflection, such that we have very high Q factor and uh, maximize power transfer into the cavity. That's the important thing. And um, you will see now from, from reality. So the, kind of the, the low power, is it, is it all uh, with, with the Indian drive or is the, the power coming from outside the, the balance itself? Mm. No, on our approach, it's all coming from the balance. So everything is on the balance. Everything you just need 28 volts going through one of these coax feed throughs on a balance and it's all being distributed there. Yeah, so that was our first approach because I feel very comfortable if all the action, everything is on the balance, <laughs> right? So that's that's how it should work. Yeah, so because Yang in China invalidated all her tests when she put everything in the balance, then suddenly she didn't have any force. Right. But so before she had this huge force. Exactly. So I rather have everything on a balance. That's I think very important too. Now. Um, the, the cavity is actually manually pressed copper. So it's a little bit thicker. So average thickness, let's say 1.5 millimeters. And uh, they kind of really did a kind of a mold where they pressed it inside. So for very nice, you know, out of kind of one piece, uh, uh, um, uh, thick uh, copper um, uh, truncated concavity. Um, it's then hand polished, you know, looks quite polished to me. And um, yeah, we have a magnetic loop antenna that you can see in here. 
Yeah? Exactly the right spot. That was very important for us when we did the model analysis to see uh, what's the optimum spot uh, to put uh, the, the, um, the antenna that we don't disturb um, the, the waves inside the cavity. And um, this is a typical graph where you can see that we have a resonance frequency here in the order of between 1.8 and 1.9 gigahertz. And um, yeah, we can get very high Q factors. So from half a million to 20,000. So you measure half a million? Yep. Can you check and ask it? Half a million. <laughs> so, so yeah, step by step, doing it properly. Yeah, yeah. So, so theoretically, yeah. I think it was like a maximum should be like uh, a hundred and fifty thousand or two hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not that stable, but the network analyzer says to me it's about <coughs> half a million. Hmm? Okay. So um, truncated pyramid looks kind of funny. And uh, well, that's what I said, it's, um, it's less efficient. So here we have 10,000 to 35,000 uh, Q factor. And um, yeah, but these are actually really uh, uh, circuit boards and um, yeah, that uh, we cleaned and uh, glued together. And um, it's very easily done. You can even then exchange, let's say, if you're not happy here with the position of uh, uh, the antenna, uh, we just have, um, then we, we can make several of these side panels and we can easily adjust the position. We cannot do this easily in our truncated cone, yeah? because if we drill a hole in there, that's where the hole is going to be. So here we can change it, that's why we did that. Yeah. I guess you're trying to replicate sunny white, but wouldn't it be better to silver plate this to get the cube a bit higher? Sounds more expensive to me, yeah. <laughs> it's not expensive. No, I mean, you buy silver nitrate and put it in a yep. thing and okay. electro plate it. But it's I mean, I would say if, if we get this Q factor, this is good enough. I mean, this is yeah, nice okay. enough. Yeah, so. But the higher, the better. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that's our truncated um, pyramid cavity. So we did this here too. And um, this is how the setup actually looks like. So we have an oscillator, so a signal generator. Then we have an attenuator, so we can control the power that's being pushed uh, to the amplifier. It's a 50 watt amplifier. Then we have a directional coupler. Uh, we have the possibility to have a power meter. First as the input that we know how much actually goes uh, towards uh, the cavity and um, then how much is being reflected uh, from the cavity. Uh, such also that to optimize um, the, whole, uh, the whole setup. And uh, then uh, we have here the free step tuner um, um, to optimize impedance and so on. Um, to go into the cavity and that's the interesting thing that we put here with an optional 40 dB attenuator so uh, we can leave I mean for the zero measurement right we can leave the whole thing including the cavity and when you put uh, uh, when you um, you know turn it on the 40 dB attenuator then there's basically no power then going into the EM drive but we don't have to you know put everything apart and put uh, a kind of a dummy resistor. That's what Sunny White did and so on. So we really leave kind of more or less the same setup and we can, we can, we can just by, you know, reducing the power that goes in, into the cavity if, um, if, because it's, it should be the power that goes into the cavity, right? That makes the whole thing. So if you still see the same thrust leaving the setup, but by reducing the power that goes into the cavity, no, then, then you know if, if there's a mistake or not, right? So you will see why this is important coming up in a few slides, okay? So that's the idea. Everything is controlled basically by the PC. Yeah, we have a Raspberry Pi on the balance, um, taking care of some stuff. We have this lab check data acquisition card. We do the frequency tracking here. Uh, we always check if we have a minimum reflected power. We can adapt that, so closed loop control. That's all working uh, quite well. And uh, if you look from the top, for example, this is my uh, uh, this is the um, the, um, uh, the torsion spring, so the the thrust balance can move uh, here, let's say up and down, and uh, you can have the zero degree uh, uh, orientation is uh, uh, looking, for example, into 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 this direction. Then with the stepper motor, you can change that. You can move to 90 degrees. In that case, we do expect that there is no thrust on the balance, right? So we expect thrust from here. Let's say, just let's say in this direction. Here there should be no thrust, and if we move it 180 degrees, then we should see the thrust reversed. So 
we should have you know, very coherent, it's a good way to check if whatever you observe is real, if it behaves like a real thruster, right? So that's uh, how you see it in reality and that's, that's what we did here. Now, let's look at the first measurement. So for example, at 5 watts. Um, so, um, well, first uh, doing a spectrum analysis and we saw, okay, Minimum reflected power at this, as we saw before from the other spectrum analysis, should be between very close to this 1.85 gigahertz. So um, that was the same as with the vector analyzer. So this is now coming from uh, the power meters, so it's all the same. And that's what we then said, track this, try to stay there. And uh, now we're doing a thrust measurement. In that case, we had 180 degrees orientation, so we expected a negative thrust. Yeah? So um, this is the truncated NASA cavity, flat end caps. Um, that case it was on air, yeah? so uh, no vacuum here. Um, not necessary in this case, uh, um, the power is really low. So uh, we had in that specific case, then we had 50,000 Q factor. Uh, Sunny had close to 40,000, so a little bit better than that. We did 80 runs each uh, 60 seconds, uh, um, power, uh, average the graphs, and that's what you see uh, what we got. So uh, measuring something like 10 to 12 micronewtons, and that corresponds to something like 2.4 uh, millinewtons per kilowatt. And that's about twice of the value that Sonny White wrote in his paper. Yeah? So this was the five watt, one five watt measurement. Now, let's go to two watts, um, and um, uh, let's see different orientations. So one looking zero degrees, one looking 180 degrees, you can even average them um, to, to see uh, where they are. And they maintain the same uh, um, effective thrust. So we are here also at about 2.5 uh, millinewton per kilowatt. Um, so all this um, kind of looks um, consistent so far. And uh, then we did this kind of checks uh, that we tried to do. So for example, we now move the thrust to 90 degrees and we still saw the same signal, yep. So uh, if this is an electromagnetic device, uh, what is the reason for that, uh, the blue line having uh, that slope that is uh, uh, very long, uh, taken in time uh, compared to the, to the, to the red? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So the red again is the amplifier current, right? So you switch on. Now, you have seen in my previous measurements, in the measurements from Sunny White and whatever, that always you saw the same signature, right? So there was always this kind of ramping up thrust, yeah, staying there, and here this is already drift compensated. So um, what actually what really happens is when you turn it on, that, um, that, that actually your serial, serial line is then up there and slowly going down. This is all taken care of myself, so it's drift compensated already. Still, well, what, 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 I'm driving, yeah. what I'm driving at is since you did this in air, mm -hmm. uh, to me this could be a thermal convection effect. And uh, you, you look like uh, that is uh, the, the, the gain exponential uh, after you, you, you turn the, the power off, typical uh, from uh, temperature of the gain exponential. So I could say this is just a very inefficient heater. Yes, um, well, it absolutely, so we are going for vacuum measurements as well, of course, this is again, this is just the way it is right now. Um, we even thought of an even more interesting air effector, which is, which is coming up. Um, Can I say something? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, the, the slope you see there, you mentioned, um, it's the damping, because we have a really high damping, and the balance needs a little bit of time to reach the the stable position. So uh, uh, I was going to ask, what is the critical dump? You, you we didn't it? measure it, but uh, mm -hmm. the calibration looks the same way. Mm -hmm. It needs a little bit of time. The problem here is um, so we only could um, measure for 30 seconds because... You don't know, like, like a guesstimate, is it 0.1, is it 0.5? No. Is it, you don't know no. how close to critical dumping it is? We have to oh, yeah. um, further investigate this. Uh, okay, but you, you, you have the ability to change the damping. Just oh, okay. Yeah, 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 but um, when we lower the damping, our noise gets worse. Mm -hmm. What was your limitation for the 30 second run? You were about to start that. So. Um, in, this measurement was actually done in pre-vacuum, so 10 to the minus 2 millibar, tor. 
and the temperature of the antifile, it's already on the balance, mm -hmm. got um, really hot and it reached um, 75. 75 degrees and we didn't want to go any higher. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's the reason we had only 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. You we would like to go longer, so we see actually the steady state, but it's not possible at the moment. Are you are you cooling line, so. Yeah, but <laughs> from, uh, <laughs> you can't put it through the bearing. <laughs> but we have a really interesting error source that we think so too. Um, so again, um, here if you have um, the, the 90 degrees orientation measurement, you can see that you get a very similar result, although it should be zero. But the most important thing that we have seen is if we have it at zero degrees and we use the attenuator, so there's basically nothing coming into the cavity, you still see the same result, you know, with or without the 40 dB attenuator, you see the same result. So thrust is not coming from the cavity. Good point. Good point, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it seems seems to us so. <laughs> yeah. exactly. So it could be something else, you know, but could be something else. But it's probably not coming from the cavity itself. Yes. Yeah? So, um, and um, to what 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 we thought uh, what something that we have to take care of is mm -hmm. most important thing. If you look at, let's say, we had two amps on the amplifier. And if you check that Lorentz force, let's say, with um, 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 the magnetic field from the Earth, um, actually you get something very, very similar. So we think it could be some magnetic interaction. That's the most likely thing that we think mm -hmm. there is. So if we tested this out in space, say, in uh, GSO, GEO orbit, uh, beyond the Earth's influence, that would be... No, this this means <laughs> this is a measurement artifact, right? So uh, um, we are getting Helmholtz coils ourselves. So plus uh, we are going to shield this in the next stack, uh, step. So we are going to wrap a um, new metal foil around the whole thing um, that, um, yeah, the amplifier will see much less of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so let me turn around the other way. If you have an interstellar ship, you want to test the engines beyond the Earth's influence before you really launch interstellar, right? In spite, of, in spite of all your instrumentation here. Sure, but so what it says is that it's not an interstellar engine. <laughs> so, far, right? so this is a compass needle. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's what it is right now. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. Alternative explanation. <laughs> so so far. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. I, I recently got uh, got an email from Roger Scheuer. Uh, he said that um, that um, actually the NASA geometry uh, should produce zero thrust, and um, that um, he sent us some. Can you repeat what he said. Yep, he, he said that the NASA geometry, the way it was published, should make zero thrust, and uh, that we have to go to a different mode to see something. So. I think you need him to say that. It's just by symmetry it has to be zero. That's, 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 we will, we will try that out. We will try all these things out and I think in a year or so we can have a definite conclusion on that. I think so. So what mold shape was, was this uh, that you showed? Was that TM212? Marcel? Uh, what? What mold shape was it? Was it TM212? Uh, we don't still not, uh, we did still not uh, verify the modes. We used the frequency about 1865 megahertz. And I suppose it should be mode TM212. Uh, okay. I'm not sure about it. Mm -hmm. No. You didn't try. No, we, we, we will. We will. The idea is to see with the infrared camera the modes and to verify this and so on. But from the analysis, it should be this mode. Okay. So, work in progress, but we're getting there. Huh? <laughs> That's the goal here. Okay. EM drive? Let's go to Mach effect thrusters. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> so, next thruster option. Okay. So um, I will start off with a really, tr really quick uh, little summary of uh, published a little paper in Acta Astronautica uh, about uh, a kind of an analytical approach how to how to uh, make a kind of an engineering model for Mach effect thrusters. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for the inputs from Jim, from Heidi, and especially Jose, who had lots of interesting discussions. So yeah, the idea was to have a 
kind of a fully analytical model where I can really put in um, you know, dimensions where I can say, okay, how does the thrust change when I increase the diameter of my PCD disks by a factor of two? What happens if I uh, increase the mass of my brass by a factor of five? These kind of things, you know, to know scaling, you know, where, where am I going to be approximately? So that was the idea here. Um, and um, here you can see the actual thruster provided by Jim and Heidi. Thanks very much again. And um, um, here is kind of the sketch uh, that, I, that I was drawing to illustrate it. So um, we have here kind of the support, so the ground balance, uh, the, uh, the thrust balance here. And um, that's an aluminum cap. There's a rubber pad here. Uh, there's the brass here. Then we have a couple of PCTs. There are epoxy and electrodes in here. And the end is again an aluminum cap. There are screws. Actually, there are two sets of screws. Screws from one from the right side, one from the left side, all going into the brass here. And uh, I was trying to model this analytically, 1D model, um, again to come up with some interesting scaling. Do you laws. have any passive PCT uh, plates? You don't have them in the picture there? No. I wrote in the paper, though, well, I did it, uh, but I didn't, well, it was so little that I didn't uh, bother to include this in the published model, but it's very easy to implement this using my methodology to implement these accelerometers if you, have, no, if you refer to them. The actual, the actual uh, uh, hardware that was sent mm -hmm. from uh, Fullerton, there were no passive piezoelectric plates? Passive? Yes. The, the, the accelerometers, that, they, that's what I'm saying, right? Uh, well, I don't implement strain gauges in here or whatever. Jim? Jose has his own terminology for the mechanical ah, components based okay. on mechanical engineering background as opposed to IDOE and different backgrounds. Okay, okay. So. However, you want to go, uh, I'm not going to get into an argument that they are not accelerometer, but. The point is, do you have them, if you call them accelerometers, are in the actual hardware, do you have accelerometers or not? In the actual hardware, I believe so, yes, in what Jim was sending. There's a pair of 0.3 millimeter thick discs that are passive, as Jose says, mounted between the first pair next to the aluminum cap and the other three pairs that make up the entire stack. So, I... I implemented them in my model, but I didn't publish that. I wrote in the paper that it's very easy to add that if it's necessary, but it's changing in the you know second digit of whatever that there's a little change. It doesn't matter at all. So yeah, so that's why I, I didn't include it here. Okay. Important thing here is in because we had really interesting discussions, Jose asked me what is my uh, uh, x-axis direction? Very important thing, right? So that I have um, you know, the right uh, terminology. So x, positive x for me is in that direction. And you will see that the thrust is actually always going in that direction. So that's what has been observed. And um, that's, um, that's actually how I also implemented it here in the model. In order to get all this science right, um, there's just one little deviation that I had to do. So um, this is the famous equation where we can see um, the change in the, in the density of the material. If you integrate them, you get the, the change in mass. Uh, so this uh, Machian uh, mass fluctuations um, basically depends on the time derivative of the power. Um, and um, I, I had here, I have here a minus sign because uh, for Marx principle from Shyam and so on, also Shyam had in the paper um, this minus sign, so I just kept it. I have to discuss with Jim about this. It's just a minus sign. It's, then, then everything is right <laughs> with respect to observation, so I kept the minus sign there. But we can discuss about this. So that's my only deviation that there is a minus sign. So, um, okay, so it should scale with power, it should scale with frequency. Question is, of course, uh, how much uh, does it in uh, the model? Now, if you look uh, for uh, piezo type effects, uh, then basically if you model the length of a PCT, it's, um, let's say, um, the length uh, as it is um, in, uh, in its ground state. And then if you apply an electric field, depending on the piezo constant, it will change. And also this is the electrostrictive constant. This will depend on the square of the electric field. So in your previous plot, you have the support where, there, it appears the support to be at the aluminum end cap, but that's not the way supported by uh, Fullerton. They had the support at the, 
where you have aluminum on both ends. Oh, I'm sorry, you had a brat there. Forget about it. Okay, We are getting there, we are getting there. So, okay, so I don't know. Very basic, okay, so this is the change uh, of length of the PCT. Now, um, um, the position of the whole uh, um, um, PCT, so the important thing for me is here, um, that I had to introduce here kind of a clamping efficiency. That's very important. If you look for piezo uh, actuators usually, they're always clamped. Yeah? Why are they clamped? Because uh, if there is no clamping, the PCT will uh, change its, its shape, no problem. So it's changing its position, yeah? its middle position. However, there is no force then associated with it. There's no force. You get a force from a piezo actuator if you clamp it. The more you clamp it, yeah, the more force you get, and the smaller will be the actual movement of the PCT. So that's a very important thing that I had to introduce in here. So I have really to uh, um, take this clamping efficiency into account to really calculate what is the real displacement and what is the real force. And the clamping efficiency depends on the stiffness, actually, of the PCT and of this clamping configuration that looks complicated and I'll leave it to the reader of the paper to figure it out. So um, um, like uh, if you put st uh, springs together, so there are parallel springs and there are springs in series that you have to uh, bring together in the right way. And if you do that, then you get the right camping efficiency here. Once you have this, you know what's the position of movement, and if you make the time derivative, you will get the velocity. Second time derivative is the acceleration, actually, of this PCT. And now, um, basically, there are two different methods of how to see. We are interested in getting what is the power, the, the power developed by the stack that gives the mass fluctuations and that gives this the thrust that we're all looking for. And so, what is the actual value of eta clamp that you got? Um, it's in my computer, I can but isn't it near one? tell you. Um, it's, um, I, it's I have to look it up. It's the stiffness of the PCT. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but, but what's, what's the actual number? Oh, divided by the stiffness. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, but he wants to know the exact number. It's I will, a factor between zero and it's, one. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> okay, I can tell you if you want. KPCT divided by KPCT by K clamp. K clamp, K -clamp. Is, K clamp has the aluminum, which has about the same stiffness as the PCT. And you have the, the bolts, which has a um, very small cross-sectional area compared to the PCT. But they're all in series. So I bet you that it has to be actually between 0.5 and 1, and close to 1. The problem is about 0.8. So That's so what my guess was. So yeah, it's a small, I can't just from engineering point of view, looking at the mm -hmm. formulas, it's, it's not a big factor out there. Mm -hmm. It's 0 0.975. 0 0.975 is very close to 1. Okay. My point. So it is a very small effect because you have a multiplying there. So you have multiplying by something close to 1. So it is very negligible effect. If you go be close to zero, then it would be a big effect. Oh, it's a very important effect because uh, for the displacement, you're right, but for the force, uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, one minus this one, right? So then this becomes very significant. So it has a it has a big effect on the actual force that you produce. Oh, but, but that's that's not that's not the force that you measure. That's not the Mach effect force. That is the internal yes, the internal exactly force. exactly yeah. So now. There are two ways of uh, modeling this. One is I call the quasi-static model. So that means usually this is being done for low frequency applications. Yeah? Now, nowhere is written uh, uh, what's the actual frequency, what's valid for this kind of model. I just kept it, and um, um, but nevertheless, uh, you can see for a typical piezo actuator in the in the let's say off resonance mode, then the force that is being developed, the internal force developed by this PCT, is the stiffness, um, the, the 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 change in length, um, and um, and uh, this one minus the clamping efficiency. Now we can take this force, multiply this with the velocity to get the power, the mechanical well the. This is really the mechanical power developed by the PCT. And this one, that's what we use in this transient Machen fluctuations equations. Uh, multiplied times the acceleration, that gives the force. You do the time averaging and you get this nice formula <laughs> that I hope all of you remember till tomorrow. And, 
<laughs> but yeah, you're not my students, unfortunately. So anyway, so um, um, so it goes with um, the applied voltage to the fourth. It goes with the uh, frequency uh, to the fourth. Uh, you have um, the stiffness of the PCT. You have the electrostrictive uh, constant. So that's very important here with no electrostriction. In that case, there is no force. Um, uh, you have the piezoelectric electric constant, um, and so on and so forth. So that's, um, that's uh, the equation. Uh, just looking from how a piezo actuator usually works, those are the internal forces developed by using them as a mechanical device. I used the same thing looking from a different direction, because I, was, I, I thought I, my first intention was actually to go this route because it's a capacitor, this piezo disk too, right? So I'm storing energy there. I like that. So I said, well, can I do the same game with saying that I'm putting energy in the capacitor, then I have also power, right, that is being developed uh, when I have an AC signal going over, over my capacitor. The important thing is here is what's my capacity? And the capacity to get that right, yeah, that I really match with the thrust that I calculate here, with the thrust that I get from the piezo actuator and what's actually been observed from the experiment is that I only have to take the mechanical part, yeah, that is from here, this capacity, the mechanical part. That's again, this is the so-called uh, electromechanical coupling coefficient, and this is again a clamping efficient, it's very important. If you put that together and you calculate also time averaged force from the energy point of view that is going to the system and just taking the mechanical part of it, you're getting something that is very similar to this one. The difference is there's 20% difference or so. Yeah? So this is very, very similar. Okay, this is standard approach using them as an actuator. Now, if uh, you go uh, for high frequencies, this is typically called a dynamical model. In a dynamical model, you are saying that the thrust that is being produced, this um, spring forces from the PCTs don't matter any, uh, anymore. Basically, it's vibrating so much that uh, actually the mass that you're being, uh, the, the, the mass that is attached to the actuator, right, that becomes the dominant part. Yeah? So, so the mass is now vibrating and, and that's the mechanical power that is being developed here. And uh, we have to uh, uh, take into account that uh, the PCD stack will actually move in one direction and the brass will move in the other direction. You will see this in a very nice video uh, uh, from, from Maxime uh, where, where you see that this is actually indeed the case. And uh, if this is, um, um, you have to assume that um, um, the, the, the mass of the PCD stack itself, it's a spring type mass, so the effective mass is divided by three, plus the external mass, which is the brass mass. I didn't include the aluminum uh, uh, mass because the aluminum stack on the left and on the right side are approximately the same. So just the brass and the piezo stack are modeled here. And I can also say, okay, this is my force, the dynamical force when it's vibrating. And uh, I multiply that again with the velocity, getting the mechanical power developed by the system. We put the mechanical power in the Machian mass fluctuation, doing the time average and so on. And this is the equation that I get uh, now. Uh, um, much better fit. You will see also the experiments where it really depends. You don't have a one minus eta clamp anymore there. <laughs> yes. Right, You're correct, but that's why there's a minus sign. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and that is that is one. There's no this one to the point nine seven. Yeah, but that's two. that's yeah. what's coming out of. But it gives the same thrust direction because of the minus sign, and um, yep, everything is okay. It looks, of course, a little bit different because it's no, a I'm different approach. Right. Hmm? I'm saying this is right. It is right, yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Great. <laughs> so, okay. So, whew. Now, um, I have to understand. I don't, the omega 6 is wrong, but anyway. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, you went from omega 4 to omega 6. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's a difference. Yeah, so um, we still have to see what's the real frequency dependence. I think that's uh, still uh, to be shown, right? So, um, and uh, um, important thing is that here now I can, I have the brass mass, right? So I, ca I can see that, you know, if I increase the brass mass, I can increase the force, this kind of stuff. These kind of games are there. But uh, yeah, I was uh, thinking a lot about this, why in the dynamic model I have omega to the six, but that's just what equations say. And uh, in, uh, in the quasi-static model, I have omega to the four. Um, I, I think it's pointless to talk about omega six or omega four because you're not taking into account damping and you have a phenomenon that takes place at resonance 
And uh, if you don't take into account damping, the amplitude of resonance is infinite, which is absurd. Right. And therefore, since you're not taking into account damping, which does not appear anywhere in that equation, there is no Q there, yeah. right? It, it, it is hopeless to talk about any frequency dependence. So when forget about omega-6 or omega-4, they mean nothing, because you're not taking into account the... Oh, but, uh, it's a, it's a poor, the model is a forced, damped harmonic oscillator. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I didn't take damping into account. That that's correct, and that was my explanation in the paper as well. Uh, this is a free mass, if I understand yeah. it. Yeah. Right. So damping is irrelevant. Okay. The other question I have for you is the omega six must come out of dimensional analysis. It is uh, extremely relevant from the point of view, just like he was showing before for the EM drive, you have the Q. And you have the, you also have a Q here. You have power that no, is- No, why should the Q enter if it's a, a free mass motion? Be because the, the power that is going into the EM drive is being dissipated into heat, depending on, depending on the damping. But this is not the EM drive. This is a dynamical yes. model uh, with this high above resonance. Okay, it, so is, it's a it is at resonance, not high above resonance. No. Yes, it is at resonance. In reality, in reality, actually, it's being operated at resonance frequency. Oh, okay. I it, is, it is operated okay. exactly at resonance. That's oh, oh I, I didn't understand. I thought that by dynamical model, it means uh, above resonance. No. No, okay. It is operated I, at resonance, and the amplitude of resonance is... Of course. Then, the then the does, of course, come in. Yeah. Okay. The interesting thing here is, um, you know, you, I think this is, this is quite nice because um, very illustrative to see what's really going on. If you, if you have, um, let's say, 200 volts uh, at close to this 40 kilohertz, typical thing. So this is how the voltage signal goes. Um, then the mass fluctuation, actually, it's very easy to see. It's double the frequency in 90 degrees phase shifted. That's what we all expect. And you can actually put, you know, a real number to it. So it's kind of... Half a, a, a half a milligram of mass fluctuation, which is interesting. It's quite big, right? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's huge. I mean, if you tell this to someone from general relativity, you will say, what? Half a milligram mass fluctuation is huge. Yeah? Yeah. But that's what it says. And um, um, that's uh, that's uh, electrostrictive part from acceleration, which is also double frequency, 90 degrees phase shifted than the applied signal. So if you multiply, uh, um, if you multiply them, then you get a really um, a time averaged force signal out of this. So this is just an illustration to see how this Mach effect thruster kind of works. And uh, you can compare this to, um, to um, data. So um, this is the dynamical model. Um, I compared to Nembo's uh, data that he had in his, in his paper, and um, those, um, those are Jim's uh, uh, measurements, um, and, and yeah, from Heidi, both, <laughs> of course, and um, this is a comparison of the dynamical model, which is right on the spot, and the two quasi-static uh, models. Um, I even, in the paper, I even gave um, a very crude model of how to estimate what are the actual resonance frequencies, depending on, you know, the number of, um, uh, the number of PCTs in your stack and the mass and so on and so forth. And it's actually quite close to what, uh, uh, to what you usually see in this kind of um, frequency spectrums. So this is just a little summary. It's a, it's a long paper. Um, um, yep, free to download it, I think, from ResearchGate or whatever. I will also put it on my, on my homepage. So if you want to play with it a little bit. The thing is, of course, um, first thing that I did is how can I make thrust bigger, <laughs> right? This is number one issue here, yeah, right? So, so um, I think uh, um, it's quite straightforward to imagine that you would get an order of magnitude better. This I'm very confident we can do uh, easily. But um, as you're saying with this, well, it would be nice to go much higher up in frequency, yeah? But then you have dielectric losses, uh, so, so temperature, it's, a, it's really kind of on the edge of materials and electronics and so on and so forth. That's, that's just something that we have to take into account too. But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting starting point, um, um, you know, into the engineering world of, of how to design this stuff uh, for a certain thrust so, value. So how are you planning to uh, increase the uh, force by a factor of 10? Mm. Um, <laughs> um, 
again, I'm doing step by step. So the first thing that I will do is to do a really good thrust measurement of chimps and Heidi's devices. Then we will replicate the same thing, you know, by our own hands, getting that done. And then we will go into a different thrust range. But according to your model, how will you go about, what is the best way according to your model to increase the thrust? Um, I have to, I think I wrote it in my paper. So it's in the conclusions. And you said I, I want to be very specific with you. So that's why um, <laughs> I, I check exactly what I said. Um, but we can do this game, no problem. <laughs> I like this. Um, so you can get an order of magnitude more if I quote myself. Uh, for example, if the PCD discs are increased to a diameter of 25 millimeters, increase diameter, okay. 25 millimeters, uh -huh. the second uh, resonance frequency should rise to 51 kilohertz. Both should lead to an increase in thrust to 12 micronewton at an amplitude of 200 That's volts. You're talking about using the second resonance frequency? Yeah. The second resonance frequency is going to be more heavily damped than the first one. Okay. But increasing diameter... So I one. didn't take temp damping into account. <clears throat> and anything else? Uh, well, we, we can... Look, I have the model, we can play around with this in how the evening. About, so. How about making the stack shorter? I have the program here, you just tell me what you want to do and I'll tell you what's the thrust. So... I will make the stack shorter because that raises the natural frequency without having to rely on a higher harmonic. That raises your first and it raises it uh, very efficiently. We can do that. Okay. So... Now, ANSYS model. <laughs> so, analytical model, great, <laughs> but let's, uh, let's get a little bit closer to reality. So, uh, uh, Maxime is actually developing a finite element model using ANSYS, and so far... Whatever is easy you want to do. Actually, it's a very good point. So far, uh, the model is, uh, of course, simplified. So, we have no electrodes, no epoxy layer, no bolt caps, nuts, uh, and it's a single set of bolts so far. Um, and, um, okay, but first thing is to really understand the mechanical movement, a uh, more complex way, verify, you know, what I did analytically, and to have a very cost-effective evalu evaluation of alternatives before buying and building new stacks to try this out with the finite element model, which is, which should be much, much more uh, complex. Well, so, also, also turn it sideways. The model of the frost? No, not the model, but the, the, on, the, on the test. You want to turn it sideways just to... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sideways. Sure, yeah, yeah. I can measure every angle, yeah? yeah. So that, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so meshing of the whole thing, and I think uh, <laughs> you're most interested in the videos that we're going to show. So, so uh, we have actually here kind of two methods in how we implemented the whole stuff. The f is the f it axisymmetric or it, is, it appears to be axisymmetric or, or not? Uh, I modeled it 3D, three dimensions. And you didn't get anything like that? You seem to just be doing this. There is no. <coughs> she modeled it with console and she got some modes that were better. Yeah, yeah, I, I have a, about 60 modes between 0 and uh, 90 kilohertz. Uh, but this is the, the exact one. deformation at resonance, which is a launch. Uh, the first one. mode you just get in the. This is not the first mode, it's uh, just a longitudinal mode, which corresponds to the maximum amplitude in the longitudinal direction. So what 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 is the what lower mode do you have than this one? Uh, I'll show you in my presentation. The, the videos are not in his. Right. This is just a very brief summary because you have how many slides on this? <laughs> Yeah. I have 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, right. So he has 30 slides coming up in the evening. I'm just trying to show here that um, the interesting thing is um, we're trying to compare here when you really implement. Um, why did this stop? It's, mo it's moving nicely. Well, hello. Whatever, it stopped. <laughs> um, basically, so here you can see um, the, the amplitude of, of movement. Um, um, in, in the black line, 
here as well. And there are two different methods. The first method here is to apply real voltage and you uh, have the piezoelectric model in here that really does the deformation. And in the second, um, actually it's more the approach that I took from an analytical model. So you have, you calculate the force and you put the force here on the piezo directly without the piezo model. And uh, it does the same thing. So that's, it gives so, very so similar the, results. The elastic, uh, coefficients that you, that you put in that model, where did they come from? Uh, from the literature for piezo actuators, which is pretty standard for that material. What material? PCT4, and it's uh, pulled in the longitudinal direction, so, so the thickness. You, so you use an uh, anisotropic model? Anisotropic, yeah. Which was a transversely isotropic, what did you use? Uh, as if it's pulled in the Z direction, so it's a thickness um, pulled um, piezo disc and um, a previous uh, literature, uh, previous paper modeled the exact same um, piezo disc for their um, simulation of an actuator. So I just basically took the same properties. And I'll show you actually the, the material table so you can, you can verify yourself. Okay, but in this uh, plot below, we are seeing uh, the first big natural frequency is something like 45 yeah. kilohertz. Yeah, right. Instead of being 38. Yeah, right. Well, there, there's a lot of simplification to the model, right? And um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all the details it's of my model. coming up. But um, again, yeah, we, we didn't model uh, bolt caps, uh, uh, epoxy layers, this kind of stuff. So um, that there were lower modes, and the, the first mode is already higher than what you're measuring. Yeah, yeah, but there's a lot of different modes. It's not just longitudinal. The, this is no, the I'm first longitudinal mode. Lowest mode. Sorry? Lowest. I thought I'd try raising my hand. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> over a cycle, is the average, uh, does it expand more than it contracts? Does it average out to its unloaded displacement? <coughs> yeah. So does it expand 20%, contract 10? Is it 20, 20? Is it symmetric? Okay, so this is the result of a harmonic analysis. So there's a harmonic load. In one case, it's the voltage. In one case, it's the force. Um, but what's in the graph is the amplitude of the sinusoidal motion of the aluminum mass. So this is just the amplitude. It, multi it goes up and down. I would have expected electrostriction to be a you know, rectifying effect in, in the voltage. So it would expand and come back to un, you know, undisturbed, expand, undisturbed. Of course it comes back undisturbed because it's an amplitude of a sinusoidal motion. Sinusoidal okay. comes back to its position and then goes in the other direction. And there's... But an you're talking about, that's a good point, but the electrofriction effect is order of magnitude smaller. This, what he's showing there is a strictly piezoelectric. Right. It is orders of magnitude smaller. So you're not seeing any, anything from electrofriction there. Oh, okay. Right. The, the electrofriction is, is uh, coming in in a higher degree. In a, it's a higher order effect that you cannot see at all there whatsoever in order to give you the Woodward force. Uh -huh. But because without it, you, don't, you, don't, you, you cannot get it unless you have a separate means to give you uh, an excitation at 2 omega. Uh -huh. in, in other words, you, you know this? Excitation at 2 omega? Yes, this is very important as far as uh, you're doing experiments and we maximizing the force. Mm -hmm. This. What you're doing here is you're providing a, a single excitation voltage versus time, correct? And you are relying on electrostriction to give you the two omega, the twice frequency excitation, because you don't like voltage square, so when you multiply the cosine and you get the two omega automatically. And uh, the advantage of that is that you only have to give one excitation. Sure, yeah. But Wilbur was Jim was previously. I know. That's why uh, it's coming up. We have an artificial uh, wave uh, generator, so we can make any kind of waveform. And actually, we already implemented this, so we can make an overlay between the the normal frequency plus double frequency and 90 degree phase shift. We can put that directly on the stack as and well. When you do that, then you don't have to. You don't need a transition anymore. I know. Yeah. That's why we did this. Yeah. And you have experimental results. 
<laughs> Look, <laughs> coming up, <laughs> just again, step by step, <laughs> that's my approach, yes, so, but uh, uh, I implemented this, it's, um, we have it, yeah, so, okay, next slide, good, so, lots of future work, yes, yeah. so, okay, we want to validate this model, of course, also with experiments, yeah, so, we have a very high frequency uh, laser interferometer um, going up to 10 megahertz or so, right? So 20, I think. 20 even, so we can measure this easily. We should be um, able to measure this easily. And so we want to validate the movement of the piezo stack and everything with the damping and everything and so forth. We will validate with actual experiments to be sure that the finite element model that we have of this type of thrusters is working. And then step by step, we will include these uh, fretted bolts, pre-stress conditions, yeah, we have to implement this electrostrictive material properties, which is not so easy. Maybe it's unnecessary if we apply this uh, anyway and we don't need electrostriction. Um, and um, yeah, lots of things to be done. It's just first step, but so analytical model, finite element model, and now the actual um, hardware measurements. So um, in order to do the proper hardware measurements, um, it's always good to have at least done something before. Um, that, uh, that you know what you have to improve on. So um, we used um, a kind of a home-built amplifier um, that was based on typical Audi amplifiers, right? I think that's what you are using too. However, we have seen that all these Audi amplifiers, that if you go really up in a frequency, yeah, so way beyond the 20 kilohertz or so, the, the signal gets distorted. So I uh, didn't like this. So I wanted to have something, we said we want to have something that is working up to 100 kilohertz. True signal. I really want to know exactly what's going on. So we had to come up with a completely different amplifier that can do that coming up in, in the next uh, two slides. This is a big, big challenge to do this. Uh, then with a custom frequency generator, also with uh, our arbitrary waveform uh, um, that you can put in there, um, that's new here too, um, for any type of frequency. Um, and uh, we have an online measurement um, of the applied voltage, current and phase. So we know also exactly what is the power that is going in there. We can track the power and all these kind of games that I did with the M drive, we can do here too. We can do spectrum analysis online. I think that's also what we discussed last. It would be nice to have always spectrum graphs before and after the experiments. We can do this now. And uh, we tried to test, yeah, the old model from 1999 and the new one that you were kind enough to send us. So um, also, um, because we thought it's really important where to store these devices if uh, they don't like uh, humidity and so on. So we bought an exicator. Um, uh, where you can store under vacuum things, which is kind of easy, nice. Um, that's what we do, limits degradation. And uh, yeah, this is our picoscope, um, oscilloscope with an uh, arbitrary waveform generator that we're using here too. Um, the amplifier was really, really tricky. Um, I think also you're using not only the amplifier, but also using a transformer to get the voltage up in this kind of stuff. Um, but if you have, uh, <laughs> I'm no, electronics expert, right? So I just rely on what everyone else is telling me. So um, uh, we have seen that if we put the transformer, the transformer itself uh, is changing the phase and so on and so forth. I don't want this. I want to have a pure measurement where I can control all of this myself. So we came up with this uh, Apex PA05 uh, um, um, amplifier chip um, that has 150 watts. Uh, 200 volts peak to peak, 20 amps, uh, and up to 100, well, 90 kilohertz, but let's say close to 100 kilohertz uh, frequency range. If I operate this amplifier in a so-called bridge mode, then I can double the voltage and I can go to the 200 volt amplitude that uh, we have seen as the former uh, example. Um, there's also an evaluation board available from this chip, um, and this really enables us now, yeah, the same things that were done before, but without any transformer in between, no uh, 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 phase shifts and so on and so forth. So really very clean going up to 100 kilohertz with very high currents. So we built this, we verified this. Um, we have an internal current limiter that it doesn't overheat. Um, so far, I mean, it's a nice little box that we built here. Uh, we have uh, two uh, vans for cooling, so we cannot put this into a vacuum yet. Um, that's an important thing. Um, we can, we also implemented here a transformer. So with a switch, we can switch on the transformer uh, uh, and we can go to much, much higher voltages if we need to. 
Otherwise, we just operate it in normal mode without any transformer, we can do this too. But I think once we feel comfortable with a certain frequency range and so on, we can just optimize then the transformer for this type of frequency. Now we did uh, a frequency analysis uh, for this thruster. So that's a new thruster that, um, that you sent to us, which, uh, <laughs> which had a really interesting uh, resonance frequency of around 80 kilohertz. Very different from all the other ones, right? So it had 80 kilohertz, yeah. And uh, this was a mystery, right? So you sent it to us and also you said, you also measured this 80 kilohertz and it was kind of a mystery why uh, it's 80 kilohertz. Um, and um, well, we um, um, did frequency sweeps and uh, um, now yeah, uh, unfortunately, so the, the Q factor here is about 52. So to also have a num of the whole thrust, the whole stack and everything, yeah? that's the Q factor that you get from the whole thrust with all the damping and so on and so forth. Um, and um, unfortunately, when we kind of ramped up in power, but again, we only do a quick frequency sweep. So we were on the resonance frequency for a very, very short time. So 100 milliseconds or so when, when we command it. Yeah? Kind of the characteristics drastically changed and we are not so sure why. We have the thrust actually with us, so we want to check this out with you then uh, together. So the resonance frequency is the same, but whoop, the, yeah, the current that you can put into the system um, uh, 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 dropped and uh, the Q factor dropped. So something has changed. You said it's maybe depolarized or so, but it was really 100 milliseconds. <laughs> so it's, it's really strange. Yeah? But um, anyway, we have it with us, so we will find out what's going on. So we. What, what is this? You said this has a, a very different natural frequency. Uh, is it a different material? What is this? Which one we sent you? I think it was it had copper electrodes, didn't it? I think so. It's a shorter. It's a different length. Jim has just disappeared. Um, <laughs> What's well, the difference? Oh, I don't not. remember what we sent, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> but I have it with me, so you can examine it. <laughs> yeah, it's in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to show it to us. Yeah. And perhaps that will jog our memories. <laughs> okay. It's been down somewhere. Yeah. Uh, okay, we will find it out. So I've already speculated to Martin that he hit a flash temperature that depolarized the stack. That's the obvious thing that might have happened. But it's still working. It just changed its Q factor. Yeah. Why, why, why? No. I know, you know, it doesn't destroy the stack. Okay. It's still a capacitor hmm. with a fairly high dielectric constant. Okay. <laughs> but, but the question is not why it, uh, after 90 watts it, uh, you got that be the different behavior. The question is why at 60 watts you got the frequency which was uh, more than twice the first frequency of the other ones, which means that the elastic properties are four times the other, the other ones. How come, where is that coming from? Why is the fre why is the, the natural frequency so high? That's the question. We've been sending around a variety of things. I think we sent Martin some stuff. The was it the APC material? material. It was a new material. Uh, no, it's a different material. Yeah, it's Several not, it's different not materials not from APC and stacks. You know, until I actually see the one that he has, I can't answer that question for you, Jose. <coughs> Yeah. We'll see. So um, that's the new thruster. <laughs> and um, of course, we're still playing around with the old thruster too. And this just shows the difference without the transformer and with transformer. With the transformer, we can ramp up in voltage. And then, of course, we have higher currents here too. Um, noise is getting better. Just frequency analysis. I'm not there yet to do thrust measurements coming up. So <laughs> step by step, I was for months down with um, building this new uh, vibration, vibration isolation for the vacuum chamber, but we're getting there. So that's coming up, but just the spectrums here so far. So uh, this, uh, when you say the peaks are at those frequencies, mm -hmm. that is under uh, how many watts? Um, how many watts here? So you can see this is uh, 100 volts and uh, 0.7 uh, amps. Great, so, so you're actually doing a spectrum at the right? Yes, that's what I'm saying. I can run the spectrum at the same power or I can run it as a thruster, whatever I want. Yeah, 
So because the, 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 the spectrometer, yeah. the, the car is running the test at the much, much lower. I know, that's why I made this myself. Good. Okay. Good. So, just uh, maybe two, uh, three more slides. Um, just saying that again, I'm doing some additional experiments uh, that I think are quite complementary. So, for example, one experiment that is um, also quite hard, I think I I told you a year ago uh, about um, the first steps on this tool that I'm trying to, to measure the influence of temperature on gravity or mass, yeah? if there is any kind of influence, because also we have big temperature changes in the material, right? It's good to know if there is any kind of change going on. I could talk for quite some time on this, but um, maybe just to show you the actual design, this was quite a piece of work. It's now halfway constructed. It's, um, it's a magnetic suspension balance in vacuum um, that uh, can change the temperature of a sample up to a thousand degrees. Yeah? So this doesn't exist up to now. And we can also you know, put PCD materials in there. So I'm really interested in that. If uh, when there's a temperature change in the PCT, how this actually affects its mass, because there's a Russian professor claiming that it actually does. So he has some, uh, some, some papers saying that this has actually already been discovered kind of 100 years ago, and no one noticed that, that there's a very small uh, um, uh, dependence of, uh, of, of mass on temperature, on weight on temperature. Yeah? So that's what he's saying. And um, I did an experiment going to very low temperatures, if you remember, and I didn't see this so far. And he told me, well, the big difference is that he did this at higher temperatures. He was going to 300 degrees, I will go to 1000 degrees. So to really make sure uh, that, I, um, that I measure this in a very correct, in, in a correct way. So that's just one of the additional experiments uh, that uh, I'm just trying out. And maybe the most complementary experiment is the direct measurement of Machian mass fluctuations. So this is all based on Jim's setup. Thank you very much again. It's, we love to play around with this stuff. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really fantastic. Um, um, basically, imagine that um, you have your capacitor, and a capacitor is sandwiched between two accelerometers, right? Uh, there's a countermass, and now you have an electric motor, and the stuff is rotating. Yeah? Now, the idea is the following. So when you um, put um, a sign signal on a capacitor, if it's not rotating, then these sandwiched piezo disks will tell you that they will see you know, expansion and contraction you know, from the force of this capacitor, no, which is similar to a kind of a PCD material, right? So, that's all changing when it's actually under rotation, then you have this acceleration, and uh, then uh, you can get Machian uh, mass fluctuation, so you should get an offset here. And the trick is now to do two experiments, one without rotation and one during rotation, and subtract these uh, uh, measurements um, very well. And um, I will just show you that um, first measurements. <laughs> We are not there yet, so there's far too much noise, so that's what we have to work on. But we are getting there. In half a year or so, we should have this experiment being performed too. I, I'm trying to wrap my mind about this uh, idea, you so said the temperature effect on gravitation. Okay. Uh, then, then there will have to be a correction for different temperatures of stars, and there is no, uh, when, you know, gravity, general relativity works very well without having to do any such correction. Um, how do you measure the mass of a star? It's based on the luminosity, right? Right, but well, the orbit. Of the planets around it. Right. The yeah. planets around, yeah. It's and we are talking here about the 10 to the minus 6 star. effect. With a binary star, with a neutral star, and so on. It's a 10 minus 6 effect with temperature. I'm not sure if, uh, okay. if, if the star is, you know, if, if we notice with all these many digits, for sure. I'm not so sure. <laughs> So, yeah. There are variable stars that change their temperature. Hmm? There are variable stars that change their temperature. Yeah, yeah. So then would, that, would, that would translate into uh, some arbitrary variation. Right. It's a 10 minus 6 effect. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really small. Uh, be, uh, a thermal effect, uh, uh, what do you call a systematic error effect? Oh, sure. 
the way he did the measurement yeah, is very different from the way I'm doing it. Yeah? So first thing, of course, is buoyancy, this kind of stuff, right? This is very important. So I build a vacuum, uh, a magnetic suspension balance. That's the best thing you can do. He didn't do that. Yeah? Um, whatever. I'm just curious. I'm just curious. So I'm trying to... What about this uh, Russian uh, Dmitriev? Uh, That's the guy who scanned this. Did, did he, what kind of experiment did he do? Okay, um, he, um, he did the following experiment. Um, he, had a, he had a setup, a closed setup, a closed cylinder, if I remember correctly. And um, there is a kind of a chemical reaction taking place in there. And uh, it's uh, thermally isolated to the outside. And he's measuring while, so, so he's triggering this chemical reaction. And the stuff is heating up internally. And uh, on the outside, it still remains, uh, you know, at the same temperature since just internal effect. And he sees this as a mass variation. Oh. Like a That's his measurement. And his latest measurement, okay, <laughs> I, I saw this paper, I was just curious. Um, um, <laughs> he did the following experiment. Um, you all know that, um, um, let me see if I get this right. So let's see, let's say you have two electrodes and you make a discharge, okay? Then actually kind of a, you know, discharge always has a shape, you know, from these electrodes going up, okay? Yeah, you all agree? Why is that? Thermal effect, right? Okay, so he's, he, he's doing the following experiment. He does a drop tau experiment. And he showed that in the, in the microgravity environment, it's still making the same shape. And he says that's why, because this is so hot, and this temperature effect that, that you know, is reducing uh, mass, and that's, so that's his latest paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. And what journal is this published? It's a Russian journal. But it's in English. It's an English translation. But, yeah, look, let me do the experiment takes another year or so and I will get very clean measurements on temperature variations of mass. I'm just curious, just trying to measure. Okay, so a couple of fun experiments. On this one here, how is it that when you rotate it you would expect to see something different than when it's not rotating? It seems like the whole capacitor accelerometer environment will be all subject to the same bias, right? From rotating, so why would it? Why would you expect this? Well, so the piezo signal, uh, the piezo is only sensing uh, changes in force, right? So if you rotate, um, basically the, the uh, um, you don't see centrifugal uh, force if you have a constant uh, um, um, a rotational velocity. Right. So there is there is no no uh, um, um, yeah, signal that that you have to subtract the coming from. Um, the, the signal that you subtract is that, uh, that there is the piezoelectric effect itself. So it does expand and, um, um, and that's why it creates a force on the sandwiched uh, piezo disks. And that's what you have to carefully subtract from, from, from this measurement. Because here what we are trying to do is the same thing, right? So we have, um, um, by varying the power, um, so by having a sine wave, right? So we should see a Machen uh, mass fluctuation. Now, we, we measure force, you have a centrifugal force. If you change the mass, then actually with the acceleration you should get a force. So you should see also kind of, um, that's what you should see. Uh, um, we have a varying mass fluctuation with the acceleration. You see this as a force signal on your sandwich pizza transducers. But it's very small, so you have to perfectly subtract the piezoelectric effect. That's, that's what we have to do. And we, we did first measurements, but it's too noisy yet. So we have to get there. Yeah? yeah. Um, about the rotating capacitor thing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we did a thing many years ago testing a, a, a version of the Mach effect involving having a tuning fork with capacitors mounted on the, on the, on the tines. Yeah. And what we discovered was that when you charge a capacitor, the forces squeeze the plates together and the dimensions of the capacitor chain shifting the center of mass. Mm -hmm. And so you better mount your capacitor edgewise rather than flatwise or else the center of mass will shift as the thing rotates. Right. 
So what Jim did is, um, I mean, you can answer this much better than myself, but um, um, basically he bolted all of this together. So you have um, um, the, you have, uh, the disc, uh, you have the capacitors, it's all kind of glued together with uh, uh, the plate on top and it's, and it's screwed together. So it's very tight. I don't think that matters. I think it's still going to change dimensions. So. John, the capacitors in the thing that I sent to Martin, I assume he's still using that, are on edge for that reason. They're not flat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... As so I still think it's better to have it sideways instead of flat ways so that if there is any change in dimensions, it doesn't affect the, doesn't the center affect mass that. position. What it will do is it'll make, it'll squeeze the material between the plates a little bit <coughs> Produce a small oscillation of that sort. Yeah. I, what it was intended to do was to see whether or not you could separately provide the acceleration and the energy density fluctuation to produce an effect. And it's not an easy, it's not as easy an experiment to do as yeah. it looked like it would be when I started. <laughs> okay. So, lots of other fun experiments coming up, but for that, I guess you would have to visit us in Dresden. Thank you very much.